welcome again to the Jack High Green at the Beaumaris Bowls Club and another Mazda Bowls coaching program. This tape, like the In the Groove program, has been designed with the assistance of the Australian Bowls Council and is aimed at the bowler already familiar with the fundamentals laid out in that program. Once again, we've assembled some big names in the world of bowls to help you with your game. Merle Richardson has a string of titles to her name including World Championship gold medals in singles and pairs. John Snell has represented Victoria on 180 occasions, while at international level he's won silver medals at the Commonwealth Games in 1978 and at World Bowls in 1980. Glyn Bazisto has a record never likely to be equalled. Four consecutive Australian singles titles and two in fours, along with numerous international appearances. Glynn was dubbed the Bradman of bowls many years ago. Those three bowling greats join with fellow international Jeff Oakley, a familiar face to Jack High viewers. Jeff is a former Jack High finalist, Western Australian champion, and long recognised for his classic technique and thoroughness of preparation. As we know, the bowl is designed to travel on a curved path, the curve becoming more apparent as the bowl loses momentum. Experienced bowlers should be able to deliver that bowl accurately along the curved path. The approved method to achieve that accuracy is to determine an angle from the centre line and to deliver the bowl along the imaginary straight line formed by that angle. The aiming point, that is the point on which we focus throughout the delivery, is any convenient point along the aiming line from a metre or so to as far as jack high. The aiming point which you eventually choose will be influenced by what you personally find is a comfortable distance from the mat on which to focus. On a slow, narrow green, I'm in the habit of choosing a point approximately three quarters of the distance between mat and jack. On a faster, wider green, I select a point little more than halfway to the object. You will notice that these aiming points are approximately level with the shoulder, that is the widest point which the bowl reaches during its course. I cannot stress the fact too strongly that having selected your aiming line and aiming point, that the feet are placed pointing directly along that line because the arm is used to working in harmony with the leg. If the feet are placed pointing directly up the green, the likely result will be a narrow bowl. Pointing too wide, would result in the bowl finishing wide of the target or in bowling across the body which would produce narrow or inconsistent results. Of 
course, this all ties in with the correct use of the mat. Let's have a look at it. Relatively small though it may be, it can be used to great effect. By changing our position on the mat, our line to the object can be altered. For example, using the right hand side of the mat for backhand and the left hand side for forehand, we can create an inside out effect, which can help reduce the bend in our drive. When playing the narrow hand on a day when a cross breeze is affecting the ball, using the outside edge of the mat will reduce the time that the ball is side on and therefore more vulnerable to the wind. One man who has used the mat to deadly effect in an illustrious bowls career is Glenn Bazisto. Glenn, welcome. I remember reading in your book that if you miss your line by one inch at the mat end, it can make a terrific difference up the other. That's so, Jeff. If you missed by one inch, you'd be two foot three away. If you missed by two inches, you'd be four foot six away. Glenn, supposing there was a bowl in your forehand drawer, um, which side of the mat would you use to get around that block? Well, you'd, you'd bowl inside out a little bit more than you would ordinarily. Instead of bowling from there, you'd move over, making sure that your foot's on the mat or over the mat. And you, you, by doing that, you control the bias of your bowl, it'll get round that bowl without any trouble and you'll draw the shot. Any bowler will tell you that control of length is the most difficult part of the game, and of course it is. We do know that the so-called theory of elevation is effective, The elevation theory operates on the principle that the higher the bowl is held at the beginning of the delivery, the longer will be the pendulum action, and therefore more momentum will be applied to the bowl. In the same way, if the bowl is started lower, the pendulum will be shorter, and the bowl will leave the hand with less momentum. It works, and many champions achieve accurate length control using its principles. May we suggest to you that next time you practice on your own, you experiment with speed of delivery. Without a jack in place and concentrating only on finishing on the centre line, deliver your first bowl to, say, three quarter length. With the next, and with your first delivery still fresh in your mind, increase the speed with which you perform the delivery action. The bowl will travel further. With the next, slow the delivery action and watch the result. It will travel a shorter distance. Why is it so? Well, the great David Bryant, a couple of years ago, demonstrated very capably to me, he compared it to walking. In other words, if we're strolling from one end of the green to the other, our steps are short, our arm movements are small. Whereas if the bar is about to close, for example, and we're walking briskly, our steps are long and the arm movements are long. The arm is used to working in harmony with the leg. And the great thing is, we really don't have to think about length of swing or length of step. Those movements are automatically controlled by thinking about the speed of delivery. The intuitive part of the brain does the rest for us. Try it, it works. Of course, this assumes that we have grooved our delivery. 
That is, we are using the same action with each bowl, but altering the speed with which we perform that action. The faster we perform the delivery action, the longer the pendulum, the longer the step. Body weight is thrown further forward, more momentum is applied to the bowl, and it travels further. Let's analyse what happens when we slow our delivery action. The arm action, or pendulum, is short. The step is short, and the bowl leaves the hand with less momentum than when the action is fast. The term percentage shot is often used on the green without being fully understood. Simply, it means choosing the shot which gives you the best opportunity of achieving a favourable result. In any given situation, there is usually a choice of shots available. Choosing the right shot at the right time often makes the difference between an average bowler and a champion. John Snell is a man known for his judgment and choice of shots. Well, I like my shot better than yours, John. I've got no danger of drawing another on the forehand. In fact, it's to my advantage. If, as long as I only trail at a couple of centimetres, I can make three shots. Yes, Jeff, I can see problems for me, particularly if I uh, wish to play with weight. If I do take my own bowl out, I'd find myself uh, perhaps even three down. And it doesn't look too... Uh, too good from that point of view, so it looks like a forehand draw for me also. Uh, I could perhaps use your jack high bowl or near jack high, or if I'm a bit narrow and turn my front bowl in, uh, okay. Yeah, well, that's taken the value out of the jack in the ditch, John. Yes, Jeff, I felt I had to play that insurance uh, shot, but uh, at least I've forced you to play the uh, controlled weight. Yes, of course, with uh, a metre or so of weight, I can still get my three shots. Uh, and the beauty of it is, with if I don't use much more than a metre, I can sit your shot bowl and stay there for shot, uh, or even get a a result off your second shot here. Yes, I'm afraid you're right. Well, what are you going to play here, John? There's nothing to stop you drawing the shot on the forehand. Well, Jeff, I'm inclined to... Uh like to play the backhand. Uh, I believe the percentage is there because uh, I have the alternatives of turning my either of my own two bowls over, sitting on the, the shot bowl, which could give me three shots. But the one that I really like is to play with a bit more weight, uh, over ditch weight in fact, where I would run through my own bowls, still able to sit the shot bowl, uh, but the best uh, result possibly I could get would be to pick up the jack, take it through to the ditch, and it would give me two shots. Yeah.
That wasn't bad, John. You got two two of your options in the one bowl. Jeff, that's what percentage bowls is all about, we'd have to say. Yes, it was certainly a good result for me. You don't have to look so happy about it. <laughs> You've left me with just a flat draw shot. Yes, uh, which hand, Jeff? It's got to be backhand in this case, John. Uh, if I happened to trail a jack on the forehand, I could still be two down, possibly even three. Whereas yep. on the backhand, I've got my own bowl as a receiver. Well, John, although I'm one down and that shot bowl of yours is a toucher, I really haven't got a bad setup here. Two second shots. If I put the jack in the ditch clean, I should get two shots. And if I make contact with my second shot, there's every chance that your touch is going to disappear out of the count. Yes, and the worst part of it is you can play it at almost any weight and it doesn't matter. That's true. That worked out all right, Johnny. Two shots. Yes, Jeff. Sure did. You got me in a bit of trouble there now. But that's my toucher there, and uh, oh, that yeah. plant is lined up pretty well for me. It is, John. The fact that they're touching, you make contact with any part of my bowl, and, and your toucher comes in almost right on top of the jack. Right. Well, we'll see if I can do it. OK, good luck. I suppose uh, I'm a little bit different in this area and one of the main reasons is I, the same as my draw shot, I like to have an object at which to aim and uh, we all know that even with a drive the bias of the bowl does take effect and most people would probably have to aim something in the order of six to six inches to a foot outside the line uh, to come back to the jack. I like to have a definite object in mind and if it can be the jack that I'm aiming at, all the better. And so, in fact, uh, I have a ploy whereby I stand the bowl actually up against the bias. Uh, just to demonstrate, the normal grip is so that the running surface is flat and straight, straight up the arm. And in my case, I turn the bowl over, in fact, so that I have my finger and thumb in a very uh, particular position. And for the person looking from up the green, that is how the bowl looks. And what it really means is you, you're tilting the bowl against the bias, and for the first perhaps uh, two-thirds of the uh, driving distance, uh, the um, bias is nullified and it won't work. In fact, it really runs out slightly against the bias, and then the bias starts to take over and it works back. But it has the general effect of going straight up the green. And I feel that that is a tremendous advantage because I can drive straight at my target. One of the most successful skips I know readily admits that he's not the best bowler around. As skipper of a team, however, his record is outstanding. I attribute this to his ability to read and to build the head. Coincidentally, he's also a more than capable chess player, and when you think about it, building a head of bowls is not unlike the strategy of chess. Mel Richardson has skipped many a winning team at top level.
Merle, it looks as though you may well be on your way to another win. I'm two shots down. What's, what's your next shot going to be? Well, I can either draw another shot or go for a backward. But I think if I draw another shot, you're still going to reach the head. So I think the best idea is to draw a backward. No, no good putting a block in? No, I don't think so, because you, you can use the mat and still get around that block and still play through the head. Yes, it's all to my advantage, actually. I've got the two best backwards. Uh, with, uh, with my own bowl, I could get three. I'll wait and see where your bowl finishes, I think. couldn't have played that any better. She's matched my back bowl, which means that even if I do get the jack in the ditch, I'll be lucky to score more than one. I may have to just dead draw the shot, or I have got a very difficult shot on the backhand. If I can get the jack into there, I could score three or four, but that's the thing. It is a very difficult shot. Well done, Jeff. Lovely bar. What did I make two out of that? Yes, you did. I wouldn't want to try and play it again. I thought you had me there. Well, I thought I had you covered. Yeah. Oh, well, two shots is good fishing. <laughs> Whether it be singles, pairs, triples or fours, victory does not always reward the best player or team. Usually, though, the winners, using their experience, build the head better than their opponents. Getting the first bowls close to the jack enables the skillful player to build the head to his or her advantage, so that if the head has changed, the player is likely to retain shot. Of course, the head can be built from a defensive situation too. Although holding shot, if the opponent fails to have sufficient bowls in the head or plays an unwise shot, that player may then be vulnerable to the loss of a multiple score. The successful player is constantly watchful for the development of a dangerous situation and nullifies the danger before it has a chance to occur. Well, I've still got that shot there for, for three that I've been trying to get. It's got to be perfect weight though now, Mel. I'll be trying to get that, uh, that trail in there on the forehand. Should make three shots if I can play just perfect weight. Let's see how we go, eh? I'm glad you missed that, Jeff. I was trying to cover it. Yeah, it would have been nice if I'd got it, but now you've got a great shot on the backhand. You can make two, three shots. Well, I hope so. <laughs> Good luck. There are literally hundreds of champion bowlers in Australia with little between them in ability. But doesn't it seem strange that names like Perella, Dalton, Snell, King, Oakley, Ormsby, Meadowcroft, Massey and of course Richardson keep bobbing up more regularly than others? Why is this? If we analyse a game right from the start, Merle, how important is being able to put the jack just where you want it? Very important, Tim. Uh, it can be the meaning of winning or losing a game by throwing the jack where you want it. Why is it so important that it can shape the outcome of a match? Well, you might be playing somebody that likes short, uh, short ends. And, of course, if you win the end, naturally you're going to take the mat right back to the six-foot line and throw it ditch to ditch. And, uh, well, of course, you can quite easily win a game on playing that way. Do you find you usually prefer a certain length end or does it vary from day to day? It varies from day to day. One day you might find that you're winning on short ends 
and then another day you go out and the green could be just to your liking and you can play well on the long ends. Well, that preference for a particular length in a match, is it something that affects every match or is it something that just bobs up occasionally? No, it affects every match. Tell me about situations that you've encountered where it's affected the outcome. Well, just recently I played um, the girl from, New Z uh, from Fiji and she had the three-quarter length down to pat. She played it absolutely perfect and it took me quite a while to get the mat off her. And when I did, I played ditch to ditch and she was leading me by quite a few shots on the short ends. When I got the mat, I was able to come up and pass her and end up winning the game. She didn't like the long ends. And rolling those ditch to ditch ends, is that treacherous? Very treacherous. <laughs> Did you lose the jack often that day? I lost it three times trying to get to the perfect length. Rolling the jack looks fairly simple. No. Is it as easy as it looks? No, it's not. It takes a lot of practice to throw the jack exactly where you want it. Do you spend time on the green just rolling the jack? Yes, I do. How much time? Oh, I spend about three hours. Uh, whenever I can get on the green, I like to throw the jack at various lengths and then try and draw mainly well, with every bowl it's very important, but that first bowl on the jack makes a big difference in the singles game. Do you think it's the most important bowl of an end? Yes, it is, because you've got the, your opponent on the defensive straight right from the word go. I'm told that unlike most bowlers, if you won the toss at the start of a game, you gave the mat to your opponent. Why? Well, I always did that because he... he we'd, invariably play his strength. If, if he were foxing and like a medium head and he threw ditch to ditch and I won the head, I'd play ditch to ditch. He'd, uh, he'd pay for that, going away from his strength and, and imagining that I would uh, not retaliate in that way. It usually worked for you? Always worked, yes. Why don't more players do it? Well, I think... Uh, Usually they uh, win the toss, they take the mat and throw their own length. But uh, in playing me, they'd probably say, well, if I, if I throw away from my length, he might think that's my strength. And uh, whatever length he played, I'd play. I also understand that you practiced the long periods rolling short bowls. Why did you do that? Well, on fast greens, not on heavy greens, but on fast greens, I could put a bowl 18 inches short in the draw. And that was the ideal position for me because if one hand is unplayable in the wind and you played the good hand and you're 18 inches short of the jack, he's got to get round you. And on a fast green, they invariably over bowl. And then I play on a ratio of three to one and I to push my bowl up on the jack or slide past it and finish 18 inches behind the jack. And he's got nothing to rest on and uh, I'm getting position all the time. And if he, if he gets round my bowl and uh, gives me a jack high bowl, well, I still play through it. And I have either finish 18 inches behind or a little bit wide, I'll force his bowl out, or a little bit narrow, I push my bowl up, so I'm playing percentage bowls from then on. Well, on that fast green, would you employ that tactic wherever you could during a match? Absolutely, during? absolutely, yes. And what about little strategies if you're in a tight situation, if scores are locked together and there's not too far to go? Well, if he's playing one hand and I'm playing the other hand and I can't make an impression on him, I'll change over and play his hand. Because, because if you leave a man, man bowling well on, on a particular side of the green and you can't make any impression on him, and you get around 18 all, well, if he's a B grader, he could get three or get a lucky shot and beat you 21 up. So when it, before, before it gets too late, uh, and I'm not, not well in front, I'll change over and play his hand and force him on the other hand or bowl better than he does on that hand. And it's always paid dividends for me. John, we hear a lot these days about the mental preparation required for major sporting events. Do you employ these techniques for a big game of bowls? Yes, Tim, I certainly do. For quite a number of years now, I've employed uh, almost, I'd say, a, a ritual before a big game. And that is I like to get away by myself, uh, maybe in the dressing room or even in the car. 
and I concentrate my thoughts completely on some small object, uh, maybe a mark on the wall or a keyhole or something like that. And it really confines your thinking to this small area and after, say, perhaps two minutes of uh, concentrating on this particular object, uh, you cut out all the outside interference that uh, tries to intrude on your thoughts. And uh, after about two minutes have elapsed, you find yourself uh, very relaxed and uh, you can think clearly. And then I start to imagine myself uh, out on the green playing, delivering the bowl just as I like to deliver it. That's very smoothly and uh, with a sweet rhythm, getting the bowl away well. And uh, uh, also being very relaxed and as if I'm really enjoying myself out there. And that makes me feel good. And uh, I'm ready then to go out on the green in a relaxed position, in a relaxed condition, so that uh, I'm ready to play the game of my life. Well, once you're out there and you're caught up in a high pressure contest, are there techniques that can divorce your mind from the pressures of the match? Yes, well there certainly needs to be because you, you can really get caught up in the game and you forget uh, of the techniques and so forth. And I believe that all your thinking has to be done before you actually get into the set position to deliver the bowl. So that when you are ready, then you place your mind virtually in a blank situation. They tell me that's nearly impossible, but uh, wherever, where, if it is possible to get rid of all that outside interference again, and uh, so that you're ready to concentrate on one aspect only. And in my particular case, I like it to be my rhythm, because in that set position you uh, already have your line, so in fact the main object there is to get your length uh, correct. So you've observed the jack length, and uh, with that, uh, in that relaxed situation, you can then deliver the bowl smoothly with rhythm, and uh, you've given yourself the best possible ch chance to draw the bowl onto the jack. I wonder just what it is that motivates these champion bowlers. Are they in search of fame, respect? Is it that they hate to lose? Or is it just the simple joy of playing well? Whatever their motivation, they do have the mental capacity to apply themselves to that most important activity, practice. Every champion relies heavily on practice sessions to maintain peak form. Too many bowlers, even some very good ones, Think of practice as an hour or so, a couple of times a week, rolling up with a few club mates, perhaps a friendly pairs match. While this is better than nothing, it's really little more than gentle exercise and an excuse to get out of the gardening. The best way to practice is with a rink to yourself. You can then practice what you want. The whole object is to practice your weaknesses until they become strengths. One way to maximise the benefits of your practice session is to spend a minute or two deciding what part of your game is to be worked on before you reach the green. Similarly, after the session, spend a couple of minutes reviewing how successful you've been. Sports psychologists call it warming down. If you are honest with yourself, you may decide that another session on that part of your game is warranted. Of course, it is not always possible to practice alone. Invariably, there are more players than available rinks. But be sure to let the other players on the rink know that you are intent on practicing a certain shot, backhand, trail, or whatever. And don't allow your valuable practice time to degenerate into a friendly roll-up. Top golfers and tennis players spend much more time in practice than they do in matches. And usually, they concentrate on that part of their game which is causing some concern. Approach shots, putting, lobs, volleys, whatever. To realise your potential as a bowler, you must follow their example. It's been constant practice over many years that has kept the much admired Oakley technique honed to perfection. So perhaps a close look at that technique would be appropriate at this point. After all, the basis of the game of bowls will always be the groove delivery. Remember, it's important that the feet be facing along the aiming line and that the shoulders are square to that line. Jeff uses the basic fingertip grip that allows him to feel the bowl better in order to make accurate corrections. The stance is comfortable and relaxed.
The body is inclined slightly forward, knees flexed and balance maintained, with most of the body weight taken on the back foot. The bowling arm is extended in front of the body, with the bowl held outside the line of the hip, so that it can move back and forward in a straight line. Now the groove delivery. Jeff bends from the upright into the backswing, takes a step, swings forward and releases at about 15 to 25 centimetres ahead of the front foot. This pendulum swing ends with the bowling arm following through along the aiming line. In returning to the upright position, the back foot is brought up to meet the front foot. This is most essential. If you find yourself stepping back onto the mat, it indicates that the weight has not been transferred to the front foot. Everything we've talked about in this program is based on that foundation of the game, the groove delivery. Actually, you will see a wide range of deliveries employed by the leading bowlers, each one with their own trademark. But invariably, the delivery action is identical with each bowl. And that is what you must achieve. Good bowling.